Hi everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Jessica Lester met her future husband, Matthew Boynton, while they were both still in high school. Jessica, a year younger than Matthew, was immediately impressed by him. What set Matthew apart was that his grandfather was the sheriff of their small town of Griffin, Georgia. This connection granted him a certain status and privilege within the community. Additionally, Matthew came from a wealthy family, which was evident from the way he dressed. He often wore designer brand names such as Hollister and Ralph Lauren, which further added to his allure. At 16, Jessica discovered she was pregnant with her first child. This news came as a surprise to her and her then-boyfriend, Matthew. Despite the support from her grandparents, who wanted to help raise the baby, Jessica was determined to settle down with Matthew and begin their family together. In December 2014, Jessica and Matthew were seemingly the perfect couple. However, behind closed doors, Jessica had a brief affair and became pregnant. Matthew, determined to raise the baby as his own, decided to marry Jessica. Matthew, inspired by his grandfather's career in law enforcement, decided to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. He worked as a Pike County Sheriff's Department jailer when he finished high school. After some time at the Pike County Sheriff's Office, Matthew's hard work and dedication caught the attention of law enforcement agencies in Griffin, Georgia, and he was hired as a patrol officer. Jessica and Matthew rented an apartment in Griffin, Georgia, where they settled with their two young children. However, Sheriff Wendell Beam, Matthew's grandfather, heavily influenced their lives. The sheriff played a significant role in the lives of both Matthew and Jessica. One of the main challenges they faced was the lack of personal resources for Jessica. Since she didn't have her credit card or vehicle, she was heavily reliant on Matthew or his grandfather whenever she needed something. On days when Matthew had to work in his patrol car, he would often take the keys to his pickup truck, leaving Jessica stranded at home with two young children. Even though Jessica and Matthew appeared to be the picture-perfect couple to the outside world, that was far from the truth. In the spring of 2016, Jessica discovered Matthew was having an affair with a 911 dispatcher named Courtney. Determined to protect herself and her sons, Jessica reached out to her grandmother for support. Together, they made an appointment with a lawyer to discuss their options. On Friday, April 15th, Jessica had made plans to take her sons and move into her sister's house. Jessica found a job at a chiropractor's office to support herself. On April 15th at 10.16 p.m., Jessica and Matthew visited Walmart, and the store's CCTV system captured their visit. The couple and their children were spotted purchasing baby formula during the visit. However, while at the store, an argument broke out between Jessica and Matthew. At approximately 10.47 p.m., 30 minutes after the initial argument, Jessica and Matthew left Walmart. CCTV footage shows them exiting the store as a couple, headed back to their apartment. At approximately 1 a.m., Matthew was on his way to the Waffle House to meet a fellow officer for dinner. However, as he approached the restaurant, he made a call to the 911 dispatch requesting a medical assistance service to be sent to his home. The reason for his request was alarming, as he stated his wife, Jessica, was experiencing thoughts of self-harm and was sending him disturbing text messages. Jessica's text read, I can't do this anymore. Take care of the children. Please tell them I love them every day. I have been suffering for a while now and no one has noticed. Here lately I have not been able to recognize the person I see in the mirror. This is not the first time I have had suicide thoughts. I love you and the boys. After Matthew called 911 dispatch and reported that his wife was having thoughts of taking her own life, the dispatcher assured him they would get officers to his house right away. The dispatcher then proceeded to ask Matthew if there were any weapons in the home, to which Matthew replied yes. He stated that his service weapon was located in the residence. While the officers were on their way to Matthew and Jessica's apartment, Matthew suddenly came on the radio and informed them that he had heard a shot fired coming from inside his apartment. He stated that as he was climbing up the stairs, he heard two rounds being fired and detected the distinct smell of gun smoke. Despite attempts to get an answer at the door, Matthew was unable to receive any response. Responding to the urgent situation, 
The officers assured Matthew they would arrive at the apartment within two minutes. They instructed him to stay outside the apartment until their arrival. However, Matthew expressed his additional concern, as not only his wife, Jessica, was inside, but also their two young children. When the officers arrived at Matthew and Jessica's apartment, Matthew informed them that he believed Jessica was in the master bedroom closet. He also said that he hoped she didn't shoot the children. In response, the officers made their way to the master bedroom closet and observed that it was locked. Undeterred, they decided to kick the door in to locate Jessica. Upon entering the closet, the officers found Jessica inside, slumped over with a Glock .40 caliber pistol lying near her body. The officers immediately realized that the gun belonged to Matthew as he was employed in law enforcement. With urgency, they proceeded to pull Jessica's body from the closet and lay her on the floor of the master bedroom. After the officers pulled Jessica out of the closet, they discovered that she had sustained a gunshot wound to the head. However, despite the severity of the injury, Jessica was still alive. The officers promptly transported her to a waiting ambulance, ensuring she received immediate medical attention. Throughout the ordeal, Matthew, Jessica's husband, was visibly shaken and overcome with emotion. Matthew wept openly, expressing his deep love and concern for his wife. His words were filled with sadness and helplessness as he grappled with the prospect of life without her. Matthew was anguished over how he would break the news of Jessica's condition to their children, terrified by their reaction. Matthew couldn't help but feel guilty, blaming himself for not arriving home sooner. He wished he had managed to reach Jessica before she could carry out her tragic act. His mind raced with regrets, questioning why he had neglected to bring his duty belt, leaving it at home instead of in the car. At that moment, Matthew realized that this simple oversight had allowed Jessica to gain access to a weapon, leading to her life-threatening injury. Around 1.30 a.m., Jessica was airlifted to Atlanta Medical Center. After Jessica was transported to the hospital, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, GBI, arrived to investigate the shooting. The local sheriff's department was unable to investigate the incident due to a conflict of interest. Matthew's grandfather held the position of sheriff. Additionally, Matthew was a patrol officer for the local police department, which further complicated the situation. Due to these constraints, the local sheriff's department was prohibited from conducting an investigation. Meanwhile, Matthew was placed on administrative leave pending the outcome of the GBI's investigation. Sheriff Wendell Beam arrived at the scene after Jessica was life-flighted to Atlanta Medical Center. Upon arriving, he promptly dispatched a patrol car to Jessica's family's home to provide them with the devastating news. Unfortunately, although Jessica was not yet pronounced deceased, her condition was critical. At 3 a.m., the Georgia Bureau of Investigation conducted a search of the apartment belonging to Jessica and Matthew. During the search, the GBI discovered bullet holes in the upper area of the closet. However, they noticed that there was no blood splatter on the walls of the closet or the clothing inside. Instead, the majority of the blood found in the closet was on pillows, one of which was occupied by Jessica when the officers found her. Later on that morning, the GBI interviewed some of Jessica and Matthew's neighbors. These neighbors stated that they had noticed gunshots from around 10.45 p.m. to midnight the previous night. One of Jessica and Matthew's neighbors contacted the GBI agents to report hearing a single gunshot around 20 minutes after the initial sound. This neighbor stated that the second shot followed sometime after the first, but they could not provide an exact time frame. Another neighbor made a different report to the GBI agents. This person stated that they heard a gunshot around 11 p.m. This neighbor also mentioned that they heard an argument from Jessica and Matthew's apartment around the same time, from approximately 10 p.m. until 11.30 p.m. As word of Jessica's tragedy spread around Griffin, Georgia, one resident of the town thought it was strange that the master bedroom closet had a lock on the inside, but no keyhole on the outside. Another concerned neighbor, who had knowledge of all the apartments in Jessica and Matthew's apartment building, realized that all the closets were structured in the same way, with none of them featuring a lock on the inside that could be accessed from the outside of the door. 
This idea further fueled suspicions that something was amiss. At 4.18 a.m. on the morning, after the officers found Jessica shot in her closet, Matthew was brought in for questioning by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The agents informed Matthew that this was a criminal investigation and requested that he come in for questioning. Matthew assured the agents that he had nothing to hide. During the interview with the GBI agents, Matthew stated that he had received a text from Jessica expressing thoughts of taking her own life. Alarmed by this, Matthew quickly drove to the apartment and got out of his truck upon his arrival. As he approached the apartment, he heard two gunshots. Determined to help, Matthew ran towards the apartment and unlocked the front door. He then proceeded to run through the apartment, making his way to the master bedroom hallway. Upon reaching the closet door, Matthew attempted to open it but found that it was locked. He begged Jessica to respond but received no response. Matthew further informed the Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents that when he did not receive a response from Jessica, he ran back to the kitchen to retrieve his service radio. As he rushed outside, he cried and appeared shocked. According to Matthew, he heard gunshots around 1 a.m. However, his story did not align with what his and Jessica's neighbors reported. The neighbors stated that they heard the gunshots occur sometime between 10.45 p.m. and midnight. When the officers arrived at Jessica's family's home and informed them that she had tried to take her own life using Matthew's service weapon, something seemed amiss. Jessica's grandmother, who knew her well, immediately sensed something was off. She recalled an incident when four of her other grandchildren went target shooting, but Jessica adamantly refused to participate, citing her discomfort with firearms. This recollection reinforced her grandmother's doubts that Jessica would have willingly taken her own life let alone leave her two sons behind. Furthermore, Jessica's upbringing further cast doubt on her suicidal intentions. Having grown up without parents, she had developed a close bond with her grandparents. They doubted that she would willingly end her own life and leave behind her two young sons. When Jessica arrived at the Atlanta Medical Center, she was described on her hospital intake form as a 19-year-old reported to have shot herself in the right skull. However, the trauma surgeon who treated her had a different interpretation of her injury. According to the trauma surgeon, neither of Jessica's hands had any evidence of gunpowder on them, indicating that she did not pull the trigger herself. Additionally, the wound was to the top of her skull, indicating that she would have had to point the weapon above her head, pointing downwards. This direction is highly unusual when attempting to take one's own life, as it would require a significant and unnatural adjustment of the firearm. Further investigation revealed that there were indentations on the wall in Jessica's closet, suggesting that one bullet had been shot at an upward angle as it entered the wall near the top of the closet, while another bullet hit the wall near the floor. These findings indicated that Jessica may have been shot by someone or something else, rather than self-inflicted. At the Atlanta Medical Center, Jessica had to undergo several medical procedures, and one of the procedures involved inserting an intracranial pressure monitor into her brain, which was used to measure and control swelling. Additionally, she was placed in a medically induced coma. This decision was made to help her brain heal and minimize further damage. Meanwhile, Matthew, Jessica's husband, made the decision to move himself and his two sons into his girlfriend Courtney's house in the aftermath of the tragedy. However, a few weeks later, the couple broke up. In a subsequent interview with the police, Courtney expressed concerns about Matthew's behavior, stating that she found him intimidating. During Jessica's first three weeks in the hospital, Matthew only visited her on one occasion. After three weeks in a medically induced coma, Jessica slowly started to regain consciousness. Her recovery was so fast that the Atlanta Medical Center staff referred to Jessica as the miracle child. Although Jessica's skull had been fractured, neither bullet had penetrated it. About a week after Jessica woke up from her coma, she was interviewed by agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. However, there wasn't a lot that Jessica could remember about that fateful night. During her interview, Jessica stated that the last thing she could recall was going to Walmart with her sons and Matthew. She couldn't remember anything after that.
The Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents questioned Jessica regarding her handling of Matthew's service weapon. She denied ever handling the gun before, stating that she had no idea how to unlock the safety lever of the holster. The agents then posed another question to Jessica, inquiring if she had ever entertained thoughts of harming herself. Jessica's response to this question was emotional. She burst into tears and emphatically denied having any thoughts of harming herself. Her explanation was that she loved her two children too much to consider such an action. After spending a month in the hospital, the doctors initiated the process of transferring Jessica to a rehabilitation program. However, it was discovered that she didn't have insurance, which presented a significant hurdle. Because of the lack of insurance, Jessica was discharged to the care of her grandparents. Upon her release, Jessica exhibited a noticeable limp. She struggled with various symptoms, including headaches, short-term memory lapses, ringing in her ears, and numbness on the left side of her body. Three days after Jessica left the Atlanta Medical Center, a deputy from the sheriff's office delivered a family violence protective order to Jessica. This order was issued by a court in response to a petition filed by Matthew, stating that there was probable cause to believe that family violence had occurred in the past and may occur in the future. The order said that Jessica was not allowed to come within 300 yards of Matthew or her children. During the trial, the judge dismissed the protective order that had been in place between Matthew and Jessica. However, the judge granted full custody of Matthew and Jessica's children to Matthew. The judge also ruled that Jessica would be allowed to visit her children every Sunday for a maximum of four hours. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents conducted a thorough investigation into the death of Jessica. After examining Matthew's service weapon for forensic evidence, they discovered her DNA on the handle of the gun, the safety, and the trigger. This evidence raised suspicions and led the GBI agents to believe that Jessica was responsible for shooting herself. Over four and a half months, the GBI agents conducted an extensive investigation, gathering evidence and analyzing various scenarios. Their efforts led them to conclude that Jessica had indeed shot herself in the head. They found no evidence implicating Matthew or any other individual in the incident. As a result, the case was closed, and the GBI agents deemed Matthew to be innocent of any involvement in his wife's shooting. In December 2016, Jessica filed a report with the Griffin Police Department, stating that Matthew had failed to return her belongings. This complaint arose after Jessica came out of a coma, during which she had to purchase new clothing due to the loss of her original belongings. One of the items specifically missing was a retainer. Matthew provided a written sworn statement, assuring the authorities that he had not retained any of Jessica's possessions. Eventually, the Griffin Police Department discovered that Matthew was in possession of Jessica's gym bag with her belongings, despite his earlier statement under oath that he did not possess it. This revelation led to Matthew being forced to resign from the police department, and he relinquished his badge and service weapon. The department charged him with two felonies, making false statements and violating his oath of office. However, Matthew was never prosecuted for these crimes. Matthew, still the legal guardian of his and Jessica's sons, faced a difficult situation in 2018 when his children refused to stay with their father. Whenever Jessica picked up the children, they would cling to her and cry, expressing their desire not to stay with their father. Recognizing the importance of addressing these concerns, Jessica reported what her sons had told her to Child Protective Services. During the investigation, the children were permitted to stay with Jessica full-time. In the spring of 2019, Child Protective Services closed the case after carefully reviewing the reports and recommendations submitted by the children's psychologist. Based on the psychologist's findings, it was recommended that the children no longer spend time with Matthew. Life has moved on for Jessica since she was shot in the head. After the incident, she decided to relocate two hours north of Griffin, Georgia, in search of a fresh start. This decision allowed her to escape the constant reminders of her traumatic past. In her new location, Jessica found love and decided to embark on a new chapter of her life. She got engaged to a supportive partner who understood and empathized with her struggles. Furthermore, 
Jessica's life has been blessed with another addition to the family. She gave birth to a son, bringing joy and new meaning to her life. 